This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 31 Mrs. Matilda Pittman. Rilla and Jims were standing on the rear platform of their car when the train stopped at the little millward siding. The August evening was so hot and close that the crowded cars were stifling. Nobody ever knew just why trains stopped at Millward Siding. Nobody was ever known to get off there or get on. There was only one house nearer to it than four miles, and it was surrounded by acres of blueberry barrens and scrub spruce trees. Rilla was on her way into Charlottetown to spend the night with a friend, and the next day in Red Cross shopping. She had taken Jims with her, partly because she did not want Susan or her mother to be bothered with his care partly because of a hungry desire in her heart to have as much of him as she could before she might have to give him up forever. James Anderson had written to her not long before this. He was wounded and in the hospital. He would not be able to go back to the front, and as soon as he was able he would be coming home for Jims. Rilla was heavy-hearted over this, and worried also. She loved Jims dearly and would feel deeply giving him up in any case. But if Jim Anderson were a different sort of a man, with a proper home for the child, it would not be so bad. But to give Jims up to a roving, shiftless, irresponsible father, however kind and good-hearted he might be—and she knew Jim Anderson was kind and good-hearted enough—was a bitter prospect to Rilla. It was not even likely Anderson would stay in the Glen. He had no ties there now. He might even go back to England. She might never see her dear, sunshiny, carefully brought-up little Jims again. With such a father, what might his fate be? Rilla meant to beg Jim Anderson to leave him with her, but, from his letter, she had not much hope that he would. If he would only stay in the Glen, where I could keep an eye on Jims and have him often with me, I wouldn't feel so worried over it, she reflected. But I feel sure he won't, and Jims will never have any chance. And he's such a bright little chap. He has ambition, wherever he got it. And he isn't lazy. But his father will never have a cent to give him any education or start in life. Jims, my little war baby, whatever is going to become of you? Jims was not in the least concerned over what was to become of him. He was gleefully watching the antics of a striped chipmunk that was frisking over the roof of the little siding. As the train pulled out, Jims leaned eagerly forward for a last look at Chippy, pulling his hand from Rilla's. Rilla was so engrossed in wondering what was to become of Jim in the future that she forgot to take notice of what was happening to him in the present. What did happen was that Jims lost his balance, shot headlong down the steps, hurtled across the little siding platform, and landed in a clump of bracken fern on the other side. Rilla shrieked and lost her head. She sprang down the steps and jumped off the train. Fortunately, the train was still going at a comparatively slow speed. Fortunately, also, Rilla retained enough sense to jump the way it was going. Nevertheless, she fell and sprawled helplessly down the embankment, landing in a ditch full of a rank growth of goldenrod and fireweed. Nobody had seen what had happened, and the train whisked briskly away round a curve in the barrens. Rilla picked herself up, dizzy but unhurt, scrambled out of the ditch and flew wildly across the platform, expecting to find Jims dead or broken in pieces. But Jims, except for a few bruises and a big fright, was quite uninjured. He was so badly scared that he didn't even cry, but Rilla, when she found that he was safe and sound, burst into tears and sobbed wildly. "'Nasty old twain,' remarked Jims in disgust. "'And that's the old god,' he added, with a scowl at the heavens. A laugh broke into Rilla's sobbing, producing something very like what her father would have called hysterics. But she caught herself up before the hysteria could conquer her. "'Rilla Blythe, I'm ashamed of you. Pull yourself together immediately. Jims, you shouldn't have said anything like that.' "'God threw me off the twain,' declared Jims defiantly. "'Somebody threw me. You didn't throw me, so it was God.' "'No, it wasn't. You fell because you let go of my hand and bent too far forward. I told you not to do that, so it was your own fault.' Jims looked to see if she meant it, then glanced up at the sky again. "'Excuse me, then, God,' he remarked airily. Rilla scanned the sky also. She did not like its appearance. A heavy thundercloud was appearing in the northwest. What in the world was to be done? There was no other train that night, since the nine o'clock special ran only on Saturdays. Would it be possible for them to reach Hannah Brewster's house two miles away before the storm broke? Rilla thought she could do it alone easily enough, but with Jim's it was another matter. Were his little legs good for it? "'We've got to try it,' said Rilla desperately. 
We might stay in the siding until the thunderstorm is over, but it may keep on raining all night, and anyway it'll be pitch dark. If we can get to Hannah's, she will keep us all night. Hannah Brewster, when she had been Hannah Crawford, had lived in the Glen and gone to school with Rilla. They had been good friends then, though Hannah had been three years the older. She had married very young and had gone to live in Millward. What with hard work and babies and a ne'er-do-well husband, her life had not been an easy one, and Hannah seldom revisited her old home. Rilla had visited her once soon after her marriage, but had not seen her or even heard of her for years. She knew, however, that she and Jims would find welcome in Harbridge in any house where rosy-faced, open-hearted, generous Hannah lived. For the first mile they got on very well, but the second one was harder. The road, seldom used, was rough and deep-rutted. Jims grew so tired that Rilla had to carry him for the last quarter. She reached the Brewster house, almost exhausted, and dropped Jims on the walk with a sigh of thankfulness. The sky was black with clouds. The first heavy drops were beginning to fall, and the rumble of thunder was growing very loud. Then she made an unpleasant discovery. The blinds were all down and the doors locked. Evidently the Brewsters were not at home. Rilla ran to the little barn. It, too, was locked. No other refuge presented itself. The bare, whitewashed little house had not even a veranda or porch. It was almost dark now, and her plight seemed desperate. "'I'm going to get in if I have to break a window,' said Rilla resolutely. "'Hannah would want me to do that. She'd never get over it if she heard I came to her house for refuge in a thunderstorm and couldn't get in.' Luckily she did not have to go to the length of actual housebreaking. The kitchen window went up quite easily. Rilla lifted Jims in and scrambled through herself, just as the storm broke in good earnest. "'Oh, see all the little pieces of thunder!' cried Jims in delight as the hail danced in after them. Rilla shut the window and, with some difficulty, found and lighted a lamp. They were in a very snug little kitchen. Opening off it on one side was a trim, nicely furnished parlour, and on the other a pantry, which proved to be well stocked. "'I'm going to make myself at home,' said Rilla. "'I know that is just what Hannah would want me to do. I'll get a little snack for Jims and me, and then, if the rain continues and nobody comes home, I'll just go upstairs to the spare room and go to bed. There's nothing like acting sensibly in an emergency. If I had not been a goose when I saw Jims fall off the train, I'd have rushed back into the car and got someone to stop it. Then I wouldn't have been in this scrape. Since I am in it, I'll make the best of it. This house, she added, looking around, is fixed up much nicer than when I was here before. Of course, Hannah and Ted were just beginning housekeeping then, but somehow I've had the idea that Ted hasn't been very prosperous. He must have done better than I've been led to believe when they can afford furniture like this. I'm awfully glad for Hannah's sake. The thunderstorm passed, but the rain continued to fall heavily. At eleven o'clock Rilla decided that nobody was coming home. Jims had fallen asleep on the sofa. She carried him up to the spare room and put him to bed. Then she undressed, put on a nightgown she found in the washstand drawer, and scrambled sleepily in between the very nice lavender-scented sheets. She was so tired after her adventures and exertions that not even the oddity of her situation could keep her awake. She was sound asleep in a few minutes. Rilla slept until eight o'clock the next morning, and then wakened with startling suddenness. Somebody was saying in a harsh, gruff voice, "'Here, you two, wake up. I want to know what this means.' Rilla did wake up, promptly and effectually. She had never in all her life wakened up so thoroughly before— Standing in the room were three people, one of them a man, who were absolute strangers to her. The man was a big fellow with a bushy black beard and an angry scowl. Beside him was a woman, a tall, thin, angular person, with violently red hair and an indescribable hat. She looked even crosser and more amazed than the man, if that were possible. In the background was another woman, a tiny old lady who must have been at least eighty. She was, in spite of her tininess, a very striking-looking personage. She was dressed in unrelieved black, had snow-white hair, a dead-white face, and snapping, vivid, coal-black eyes. She looked as amazed as the other two, but Rilla realized that she didn't look cross. Rilla also was realizing that something was wrong, fearfully wrong. Then the man said, more gruffly than ever, "'Come now! Who are you, and what business have you here?' Rilla raised herself on one elbow, looking and feeling hopelessly bewildered and foolish. She heard the old black-and-white lady in the background chuckle to herself. She must be real, Rilla thought. I can't be dreaming her. Aloud, she gasped, Isn't this Theodore Brewster's place? No, said the big woman, speaking for the first time. This place belongs to us. We bought it from the Brewsters last fall. They moved to Greenvale. Our name is Chapley. Poor Rilla fell back on her pillow, quite overcome. I beg your pardon, she said. I, I thought the Brewsters lived here. Mrs. Brewster is a friend of mine. I am Rilla Blythe, Dr. Blythe's daughter from Glen St. Mary. I—I I was going to town with my—my 
my—this little boy, and he fell off the train, and I jumped off after him, and nobody knew of it. I knew we couldn't get home last night, and a storm was coming up. So we came here, and when we found nobody at home, we—we we just got in through the window and—and and made ourselves at home. So it seems," said the woman sarcastically. "A likely story," said the man. "We weren't born yesterday," added the woman. Madame Black and White didn't say anything, but when the other two made their pretty speeches, she doubled up in a silent convulsion of mirth, shaking her head from side to side and beating the air with her hands. Rilla, stung by the disagreeable attitude of the Chapleys, regained her self-possession and lost her temper. She sat up in bed and said in her haughtiest voice, "I do not know when you were born or where, but it must have been somewhere where very peculiar manners were taught. If you will have the decency to leave my room, er,、uh, this room, until I can get up and dress, I shall not transgress upon your hospitality." Rilla was killingly sarcastic. Any longer, and I shall pay you amply for the food we have eaten and the night's lodging I have taken. The black and white apparition went through the motion of clapping her hands, but not a sound did she make. Perhaps Mr. Chapley was cowed by Rilla's tone, or perhaps he was appeased at the prospect of payment. At all events, he spoke more civilly. Well, that's fair. If you pay up, it's all right. She shall do no such thing as pay you," said Madame Black and White in a surprisingly clear, resolute, authoritative tone of voice. "If you haven't got any shame for yourself, Robert Chapley, you've got a mother-in-law who can be ashamed for you. No stranger shall be charged for room and lodging in any house where Mrs. Matilda Pitman lives." Remember that though I may have come down in the world, I haven't quite forgot all decency for all that. I knew you was a skinflint when Amelia married you, and you've made her as bad as yourself. But Mrs. Matilda Pitman has been boss for a long time, and Mrs. Matilda Pitman will remain boss. Here, you, Robert Chapley, take yourself out of here and let that girl get dressed. And you, Amelia, go downstairs and cook a breakfast for her. Never in all her life had Rilla seen anything like the abject meekness with which those two big people obeyed that might. They went without word or look of protest. As the door closed behind them, Mrs. Matilda Pitman laughed silently and rocked from side to side in her merriment. "Ain't it funny?" she said. "I mostly lets them run the length of their tether, but sometimes I has to pull them up, and then I does it with a jerk. They don't dast aggravate me because I've got considerable hard cash, and they're afraid I won't leave it all to them." Neither I will. I'll leave 'em some, but some I won't, just to vex 'em. I haven't made up my mind where I will leave it, but I'll have to soon, for at eighty a body is living on borrowed time. Now you can take your time about dressing, my dear, and I'll go down and keep them mean scallywags in order. That's a handsome child you have there. Is he your brother? No, he's a little war baby I've been taking care of because his mother died and his father was overseas. Answered Rilla in a subdued tone. War baby. <laughs> well. I'd better skin out of here before he wakes up, or he'll likely start crying. Children don't like me. Never did. I can't recollect any youngster ever coming near me of its own accord. Never had any of my own. Amelia was my stepdaughter. Well, it saved me a world of bother. If kids don't like me, I don't like them. So that's an even score. But that certainly is a handsome child. Jims chose this moment for waking up. He opened his big brown eyes and looked at Mrs. Matilda Pitman unblinkingly. Then he sat up, dimpled deliciously, pointed to her, and said solemnly to Rilla, "Pretty lady, Willa, pretty lady." Mrs. Matilda Pitman smiled. Even eighty odd is sometimes vulnerable in vanity. I've heard that children and fools tell the truth," she said. "I was used to compliments when I was young, but they're scarcer when you get as far along as I am. I haven't had one for years. It tastes good. I suppose now, you monkey, you wouldn't give me a kiss." Then Jims did quite a surprising thing. He was not a demonstrative youngster and was cherry with kisses even to the Ingleside people, but without a word he stood up in bed, his plump little body encased only in his undershirt, ran to the footboard, flung his arms about Mrs. Matilda Pitman's neck and gave her a bear hug, accompanied by three or four hearty, ungrudging smacks. "Jims," protested Rilla, aghast at his liberty. "You leave him be," ordered Mrs. Matilda Pitman, setting her bonnet straight. "Laws, I like to see someone that isn't scared of me. Everybody is." You are, though you're trying to hide it. And why? Of course, Robert and Amelia are because I make 'em scared on purpose. But folks always are, no matter how civil I be to them. Are you going to keep this child? I'm afraid not. His father is coming home before long. Is he any good? The father, I mean. Well, he's kind and nice, but he's poor, and I'm afraid he always will be. Faltered Rilla. I see. Shiftless. Can't make or keep. Well, I'll see. I'll see. I have an idea. It's a good idea, and besides, it'll make Robert and Amelia squirm. That's its main merit in my eyes. 
though I like that child, mind you, because he ain't scared of me. He's worth some bother. Now you get dressed, as I said before, and come down when you're good and ready. Rilla was stiff and sore after her tumble and walk of the night before, but she was not long in dressing herself and Jim's. When she went down to the kitchen she found a smoking hot breakfast on the table. Mr. Chapley was nowhere in sight, and Mrs. Chapley was cutting bread with a sulky air. Mrs. Matilda Pittman was sitting in an armchair, knitting a grey army sock. She still wore her bonnet and her triumphant expression. "'Set right in, dears, and make a good breakfast,' she said. "'I am not hungry,' said Willa, almost pleadingly. "'I don't think I can eat anything. And it is time I was starting for the station. The morning train will be along soon. Please excuse me and let us go. I'll take a piece of bread and butter for Jim's.' Mrs. Matilda Pittman shook a knitting-needle playfully at Rilla. "'Sit down and take your breakfast,' she said. "'Mrs. Matilda Pittman commands you. Everybody obeys Mrs. Matilda Pittman, even Robert and Amelia. You must obey her, too.' Rilla did obey her. She sat down, and such was the influence of Mrs. Matilda Pittman's mesmeric eye, she ate a tolerable breakfast. The obedient Amelia never spoke. Mrs. Matilda Pittman did not speak either, but she knitted furiously and chuckled. When Rilla had finished, Mrs. Matilda Pittman rolled up her sock. "'Now you can go if you want to,' she said. "'But you don't have to go. You can stay here as long as you want to, and I'll make Amelia cook your meals for you.' The independent Miss Blythe, whom a certain clique of junior Red Cross girls accused of being domineering and bossy, was thoroughly cowed. "'Thank you,' she said meekly. "'But we really must go.' "'Well, then,' said Mrs. Matilda Pittman, throwing open the door, "'your conveyance is ready for you. I told Robert he must hitch up and drive you to the station. I enjoy making Robert do things. It's almost the only sport I have left. I'm over eighty, and most things have lost their flavour except bossing Robert.' Robert sat before the door on the front seat of a trim, double-seated, rubber-tired buggy. He must have heard every word his mother-in-law said, but he gave no sign. "'I do wish,' said Rilla, plucking up what little spirit she had left, "'that you would let me—oh—uh—' uh, Then she quailed again before Mrs. Matilda Pittman's eye. "'Recompense you for—for—' for, Mrs. Matilda Pittman said before, and she meant it, that she doesn't take pay for entertaining strangers, nor let other people where she lives do it much as their natural meanness would like to do it. "'You go along to town, and don't forget to call the next time you come this way. Don't be scared. Not that you are scared of much, I reckon, considering the way you sassed Robert back this morning. I like your spunk. Most girls nowadays are such timid, scary creatures. When I was a girl I wasn't afraid of nothing nor nobody. Mind you take good care of that boy. He ain't any common child. And make Robert drive round all the puddles in the road. I won't have that new buggy splashed.' As they drove away, Jims threw kisses at Mrs. Matilda Pittman as long as he could see her, and Mrs. Matilda Pittman waved her sock back at him. Robert spoke no word, either good or bad, all the way back to the station, but he remembered the puddles. When Rilla got out at the siding she thanked him courteously. The only response she got was a grunt as Robert turned his horse and started for home. "'Well,' Rilla drew a long breath, "'I must try to get back into Rilla Blythe again. I've been somebody else these past few hours. I don't know just who.' some creation of that extraordinary old person's. I believe she hypnotized me. What an adventure this will be to write the boys!" And then she sighed. Bitter remembrance came that there were only Jerry, Ken, Carl, and Shirley to write it to now. Jem, who would have appreciated Mrs. Matilda Pittman keenly. Where was Jem? End of chapter 31